It is true that we need to eat fewer calories to lose weight. And in some cases, calorie counting can be a useful tool. But calorie counting can be highly inaccurate. In this video, I'll explain why it's an approach that as a dietitian, I don't commonly use. And I will teach you when to take calorie counting seriously and when to take it with a pinch of salt. And if you're new here, I'm Maria and I'm a registered dietitian. Welcome to the channel. Before you start getting frustrated, obviously calories count to some extent. For instance, 200 calories of chocolate is obviously more than 100 calories of chocolate. So if you really wanted a chocolate bar, but your goal was to lose weight, in this instance, if you had the choice between a purple snack bar for 100 calories or a Mars bar for 200 calories, then of course the purple snack is going to be the better choice. However, comparing 200 calories of chocolate, which I have here, to 200 calories of broccoli, is unreasonable. This is some food for thought. But most of us know this by now. The broccoli is a lot more volume. It's gonna provide us with fiber, more vitamins and minerals than the chocolate. So today I'm gonna to be unraveling a lot more than just the simple differences here. Now I'm very transparent on this channel and I will disclaim that as a dietitian, I do count calories most days in my clinical practice but not in the way that many of you will think. I count calories, for example, when I have a patient on a tube feed in ICU, or if I have a baby on formula milk that isn't growing. But when I have a client that has maybe diabetes, is trying to lose weight, or simply is trying to improve their health, calorie counting is a tool that I very rarely use. One reason is for the mathematical inaccuracies, which we'll break down today. But one of the main reasons is because when people start to count calories, it can completely and utterly destroy their relationship with food. And food isn't a number, it's a delicious thing that helps keep us alive. And having a damaged relationship with food is awful. It can dramatically impact your quality of life because we all have to eat every single day and multiple times a day. And counting calories can easily slip into disordered eating which can have the opposite effect, which can make it harder for people to manage their weight. And it can happen so fast that even the person doesn't recognize it for what it is. It's a slippery slope. And when I say disordered eating or eating disorders, somebody struggling with disordered eating can be any gender, any size, any weight. And a poor relationship with food can often lead to a restrict binge cycle which makes healthy eating and weight management more difficult. And ultimately, food is something that should complement your life, not dominate it. It shouldn't be a source of anxiety or stress. And having to calculate up all your food and calories all of the time is not practical or a life for many of us to live. If you have used calorie counting in the past, let me know in the comments. I'd love to know if it did or didn't work for you. Maybe you found it useful or maybe you found it triggering. Because ultimately, we're all different and different approaches work for different people. Now onto the maths. Why is calorie counting so inaccurate? Now the first thing I wanna chat about is diet-induced thermogenesis. And that sounds like an absolute mouthful. So let's digest it. When you're counting calories, are you counting them as they appear on your plate? Or are you counting calories when they've gone into your body and are digested and ready to be used? Because it takes energy or calories to break down the food that you've eaten. Take for example, if I was to give you an apple or a glass of apple juice, which one do you think will require more energy or more effort for your body to break down and utilize once you've eaten it? Hopefully most of you have said apple. The body needs to eat, chew, digest, break down, and metabolize the food that you eat into something that it can use in your body. And this all requires calories. So it takes calories to break down food and use them. Now in food, we have different macronutrients. Take protein, fats, and carbs as an example. And they all require different amounts of energy to break down. Now protein requires the most energy for the body to break down and utilize. It's more of an in-depth process. It takes a little bit longer. Think of your body trying to break down and digest a big steak and therefore it uses up a bit more energy. So we have four calories for every gram of protein in our food, as somewhere between 20 to 30% of the calories in the protein are used up breaking it down. There's four calories per gram of carbohydrate, but you could argue it's closer to 3.6, as around five to 10% of the calories are used to break it down. As for fats, they're pretty easy for the body to use and uses from zero to 5% of the energy to utilize it. So protein takes the most energy to break down, then carbohydrates and then fat. And this whole process is called diet-induced thermogenesis because it's effort for your body and it makes you hotter doing the work. If you remember Joy from Friends saying, here comes the meat sweats, 
Well, now you know why. Practically, are you going to look at each food that you eat and readjust the calories? No, you're not. It's just not practical. So in general, in healthy people with a mixed diet, we allow this diet-induced thermogenesis to account for around 10% of energy. So in other words, 10% of the calories that we eat are used simply to break down the food. Obviously, the more food you eat and the more protein you eat will increase this. An interesting point is the thermic effect of alcohol is similar to protein. So if you've ever gone a night out and you were cold at the start if you're living in Ireland, but you find yourself heating up after a few drinks, this is your body metabolizing the alcohol. Now, before I move on to my next point, I'd really appreciate it if you're enjoying the video so far that you hit the red subscribe button below. It really helps support my channel so I can continue to make more videos like this one. And while you're at it, you can give the video a like or a thumbs up too. Now the next calorie counting inaccuracy that we're going to look at is caloric availability. Basically how available the calories are, as the name suggests. Now my food for thought to get you thinking about this point is what dietitians like to call the sweet corn test. Have you ever eaten sweet corn in a salad or a corn in the cob? And a few hours or days later, you've seen it in your poo. But to get you thinking now, if you're looking at a tin of sweet corn, but then tomorrow you see it in the toilet. Logically, are all of these calories being absorbed? I think we can agree that some of them are not available. They've gone all the way through. So this is what I mean by caloric availability. And this differs so much between different foods and many things can impact it. But again, you can see where the calorie counting can become quite inaccurate. So in order for us to digest our food, we have to mechanically break it down into tiny pieces through our teeth, for example, and through churning in our stomach. And then we also need to chemically break it down through digestive juices. So let's take the sweet corn again as an example. When sweet corn is turned into something like a tortilla, it's mechanically broken down for you. So the sweet corn is broken down into a flour and it's rolled into a tortilla. So it's been made into tiny pieces already. So when you eat the tortilla, all the body really needs to do then is chemically break it down. It no longer has to do the mechanical digestion. And that's why you don't see tiny bits of sweet corn in your poo after you eat something like tortilla. Most of the calories available in the more processed version, which is the tortilla here, are available to the body. Whereas with the whole sweet corn, not all of the calories are available. So if you're looking at calories per 100 grams of the sweet corn versus the tortilla, the sweet corn will have less available to the body. I hope that makes sense. Now I'm gonna look at how calories are calculated. We've all seen calorie labels on the packaged foods that we buy. So when scientists are trying to figure out the calories of something, they usually light it on fire in a lab and extract all of the energy from it. And then they tell us how much energy or how much calories is in 100 grams of it. But in a lab is a very different process to what happens in your digestive system. So we're gonna take nuts for example. In a lab, they're extracting all of the calories that come from nuts. For example, when they do this with almonds, a serving results in 170 calories when they work it out this way. But in the lab versus when we eat nuts is different. When we eat nuts, due to their structure, we can't extract all of the calories from them. And in fact, about 30% of the calories end up in the toilet. So with this example, we only absorb about 129 calories out of the proposed 170 calories here. Now, if you take the nuts and you physically break them down into something like an almond butter, you will extract more of the calories than if you were just to eat the nuts whole. Again, that's because they've been mechanically broken down a lot more, making them a lot more available for your body. But this is important because it shows that we might look at the back of a pack and go, okay, these nuts are super high in calories, but really we need to be taking away 30% of that if we're not accessing that 30%. Now think of it another way. When we chop up and cook our food, we're actually partially digesting it because if you remember, digesting it is mechanically breaking it down into smaller bits and chemically digesting it with digestive juices. So when we chop our food and then cook it, that is partially digesting it. But if you're thinking of it from a caloric availability point of view, when you chop and cook your food, the calories are now more available because you've already done a lot of the work and you've made digestion so much easier. The chopping and cooking process has already started mechanically breaking the food down. So when you're thinking of counting calories, people tend to think of them like a simple math equation. But really, if you eat 2000 calories of a more processed food versus 2000 calories of a whole food, you can now understand that the 2000 calories of the processed, more broken down food is much more available to the body than the whole form because you know you're probably not accessing all of these calories and some of them are ending up in the toilet. Now you can also include that diet induced thermogenesis that we spoke about in this conversation as well. Because again, the more processed a food is, the less work, the easier it is for your body to break down. So it doesn't need to use as much energy digesting it. So the diet induced thermogenesis is gonna be less here for the processed food as well. There was one interesting study done that showed that the body burns nearly 
nearly 50% fewer calories digesting a meal of processed food than a meal of whole foods, despite them both containing the same theoretical amount of calories. And not only that, but since it doesn't take much to digest these foods, you're likely to be hungry again sooner after eating them. So it takes longer for the whole food to leave your stomach compared to the processed foods which are easily and quickly digested. Think of it logically, going back to the apple again. An apple takes longer to eat and it's way more filling than apple sauce, which itself is more satiating than a glass of apple juice. And they've actually studied this one too. They've studied the knock-on effects in terms of if you had the apple or the apple juice, would it impact how much you're eating at your next meal? And eating an apple did. The participants that ate the apple ate less at their next meal. And this is because the apple juice and the apple sauce, they're quick to digest and they don't have the same impact on satiety. Another secret weapon in all of this calorie talk is our gut microbiome. These are the bacteria, viruses, and fungi that all live inside in our gut. And these gut bacteria and the chemicals that they produce can actually impact your appetite. These chemicals, such as short chain fatty acids, tell our body when we've had enough to eat. They hold off the production of hunger hormones like ghrelin and they increase the hormones that tell us that we're full and we're finished eating like leptin and other chemicals produced by our gut microbiota are thought to target the reward network in our brain which influences our relationship with food and our tendencies towards emotional eating. As a dietitian I also have to point out that the level of processing is relevant from a micronutrient point of view because processing can sometimes reduce the amount of nutrients in a food. Now this is a blanket statement which isn't always true but the nutrients within the food do often change when you process it. Now I don't want you to think that I'm against processed food. I think they have their place and some processing is definitely definitely okay. But the ultra processed foods are definitely going to be a lot less nourishing than their original counterpart. I also want to draw your attention to the accuracy of calories on labels. Calories on food labels on the back of the pack are never fully accurate. In fact, legally, companies are allowed a 20% error margin. And when you're eating out in restaurants, who is calculating the calories on the menu? Recipes will always differ a little bit between chefs. And you need to consider things like, is it a registered dietitian trained in nutritional analysis that has calculated the calories? Or is someone else trying to do it? I've been to many cafes and restaurants where I can tell straight away that the calories they say are in something are hugely inaccurate. And finally, going back to my first point, I could make two meal plans for a client that have the exact same amount of calories. But I could make meal plan A with a lot more whole food, which is going to be a lot more filling, or I could have a meal plan B, which is a lot more calorie dense food, but they're ultimately the same calories. But you might not manage to follow meal plan B for very long. Because weight loss is all about sustaining change over the long term. And while calories can in some ways be useful, there's a lot more strategies that should be implemented in building a sustainable way of eating that can help you manage your weight. And this is why, apart from the risk of ruining your relationship with food by counting calories, you don't often get people to do it. So all in all, counting calories is very inaccurate. When you think of the availability of the calories, like in the nuts, the processing of them, like the sweet corn versus the tortilla. And when you include the diet-induced thermogenesis, the energy needed to break them down. Counting calories just becomes less and less accurate. Now counting calories once in a while can be helpful for some people but I really say some here as a person's relationship with food can be very fragile and the pros and cons need to be considered. Sometimes it can help people become more aware of what they're eating especially when they're trying to lose weight. For example you might realize that salad dressing you thought was a good choice actually has 300 calories or all the little picking and snacking you're doing here and there is really starting to add up. But there's other ways to become more aware of your behaviors around food than just calorie counting. Finally for my my approach and what I've seen work better is teaching my clients how to read food labels properly and improve their calorie awareness without necessarily going to the extreme of counting the calories and everything they eat. And when making changes, it's often more helpful to pay attention to the nutritional content of your food. Looking at things like how are you structuring your meals and snacks throughout the day? Do you know how to properly make a balanced meal or a snack? And often, if you focus your counting attention elsewhere, rather than on calories, you will be making healthier food choices by default. Thinking about eating more protein, enough fiber, less sugar, calcium for your bones. So let me know in the comments below your thoughts on calorie counting. And if you've made it this far in the video, I want to thank you by letting you know about my free recipe ebook which I've linked below in the description box. Make sure you're subscribed to the channel, give the video a like and thank you very much for watching and I'll see you again next week.